All right, we're going to get started. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon in the Introduction to WASH Disease Transmission session. Oh, hey Zach, what's going on? Oh, I'm so sorry. Diarrhea and cramps. I'm so bad at taking videos. What do you think? Is there anything I can do for you? Do you need some water, some? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Toilet paper. I may just take Toilet paper. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I really hope you feel better soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. How many of us in this room have had diarrhea, cramping? Yeah. Well, this is a commercial I've seen on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'm not promoting anything. The only way looks like <laughs> um, what 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 did you think the cause was when you had diarrhea or cramping, stomach problems? Food poisoning. Food poisoning. Yep. Bad food. What else? Deadly water. Deadly water. Yep. Critter in the water that I drink. Critter in the water. Okay. Other thoughts? We we work with a lot of teams in Ecuador that come down, and that's. It's always the water, they say, but we're finding a lot, it's, it's dehydration. Mm -hmm. um, they're not used to the altitude, to the heat, and they don't drink. Okay. So, um, that's what we think it is. Yeah. But I'm in construction, so. I <laughs> <laughs> Could be a contributing factor, absolutely. Yeah, certainly. I my toothbrush out of the sink one time in the Dominican Republic. Ooh. That's all it took. Yeah. So you felt like you were really careful in terms of the other practices that you had, but... Yeah, but that was my mistake. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Hands. hands. Yeah, maybe I didn't do a very good job of washing my hands before I ate my meal, and then I ate with my hands when I, I was traveling. Yeah, so there are lots of different ways that we can obviously get sick with water, sanitation, hygiene-related diseases. So we want to talk a little bit about that this afternoon. So what does actually make us sick when we do get that illness? What makes us sick? Critters. Critters. What are some other names that we might call these? Hysteria. Okay, so those would be more the diseases. Yeah. Viruses and bacteria. Yeah, so and those are types of what? There are types of microorganisms. There are types of pathogens. Um, and, and I'm actually gonna, so if I can pause for a minute, we're actually gonna talk today about the four different types of pathogens that can make us sick. Um, we're gonna talk about different transmission routes of diseases, identify different diseases related to WASH, explain how <laughs> WASH can prevent the transmission of diseases, and then we're gonna use some participatory learning tools to generate discussion about WASH diseases and transmission. So some tools that you can use in community and groups that you're working with. So, what is a pathogen? I think I just actually shared it, um, but it's really any living organism that causes disease, any type of organism. And in this case, in WASH, we talk about a few different kinds of microorganisms. So those are the ones that we can't see very easily without a microscope. Um, and somebody already mentioned a few of them. There are four different types. I heard viruses and bacteria. What are some of the other ones? Two more. Protozoa. Protozoa. Yep. What else? Helminths. helminths. Yeah, helminths are worms. So those are the four basic organisms. And I'm gonna talk about each of them because they're particularly important when we talk about the different diseases that are caused by these pathogens and also their characteristics and how we would prevent their transmission. 
Um, so these are actually listed in the order of size. So viruses are the smallest um, and they can't reproduce by themselves. Bacteria are the most common living things found in human and animal feces and they replicate quite quickly. Protozoa, they, some of them form cysts, so they're actually, when you look at this, they overlap a little bit in terms of the size of bacteria, but can also be quite up to four times bigger than bacteria. And then helminths are worms and flukes, and they require some type of host organism, um, and they're passed out in human and animal feces. So when we look at that size comparison, smallest to largest, if we were, say, looking under a microscope, this would be our comparison for how big they are. So a virus would be that little pinprick that you see. Bacteria would be quite a bit bigger, protozoa, and then helminths. Um, and so in this track, we're actually going to talk more in later sessions around water treatment. And size becomes particularly important when we're looking at what treatment would work well to remove these four different types of pathogens. So let's talk a little bit about each one individually. Um, so viruses, a couple of examples of those would be hepatitis A and E. Those are both transmitted in water. Um, they can't reproduce by themselves. They need something else in order to reproduce. Any type of host, so it could be a microorganism, it could be animal, it could be a human. These are actually quite difficult to study. Um, we know a lot less about them than many other types of pathogens. Um, it's quite expensive to set up virus testing and laboratories. So I usually clarify here that while human immuno HIV is a virus, that's obviously not transmitted in water, or influenza or flu. Um, but in terms of wash, influenza and flu is quite important when it comes to hand washing. So bacteria, as I said initially, they're the most common living thing found in feces. So in one gram of feces, there are billions of bacteria. So it only takes a really, really small amount to spread bacteria. And often, but not always, diarrhea can be a symptom of a lot of our bacteria, wash-related diseases. Um, you'd see diseases like cholera, typhoid, shigellosis. They're by far, as I said, the most common. I'm going to actually pop open a video for us. Some living things remain a single cell throughout their lives. For example, these are E. coli bacteria. Millions of these microscopic creatures inhabit our intestines. Bacteria are very simple creatures. Unlike most cells, a bacterium doesn't even have a nucleus. But when it comes to reproducing, Bacteria are marvels of efficiency. When a bacterium reproduces, it pinches in the middle, and then the cell divides in two. Each of the two new cells is exactly like the original one. Bacteria can reproduce very rapidly. Some types divide once every 20 minutes. At this rate, a single bacterium can become over a billion bacteria in less than 12 hours. This kind of reproduction is called asexual reproduction because only one parent is needed to reproduce. Yeah, it happens quite fast and before you know it, you can have quite a bit of spread of disease. So the next one we're going to look at is protozoa. So this is an example of a cyst that we were talking about, Cryptosporidium. Um, so some need a host to survive, not all. And the cysts in particular are resistant to chlorine when it comes to water treatment. 
So cryptosporidium can't be inactivated by chlorine, um, which is challenging in, our, in terms of making the water safer. Um, some do stay alive outside of a host for longer periods, so they could live in the environment and the soil. Um, that cyst can often be a strong shell that helps them be resistant to any type of environmental impact on them. Um, so it means they can last quite a long time. Um, and here are some examples of protozoa that we would see. Entamoeba histolica, cryptosporidium, and giardia. Years. Yeah, for some years. So helminths, the last and the largest of them, um, these are worms and flukes. So here are some of the examples, liver fluke, guinea worm, um, schistosomiasis or bilharzia. Um, Actually, I would say that guinea worm is quite a success story in the wash sector. Um, it's very, very close to eradication. Really, it only remains in South Sudan. Um, the Carter Center has worked for many, many years to eradicate guinea worm and has done an amazing job over the last 20, 25 years to get rid of a pretty nasty wash-related pathogen. So you can see that small worm, you, you drink contaminated water and the worm then hatches in your stomach and it takes about a year to maybe 14, 16 months to grow and then it'll, it'll find its way through the blood vessels and it'll search for a way to come out of your body. Often it's right on the foot or near the ankle um, where it will slowly come out. You can turn it a little bit on a pencil in order to remove it little by little. Um, you can't sort of surgically remove it. It takes quite a long period of time and is very painful and debilitating. Yeah, I don't know. Does that, anyone here have any experience seeing guinea worm in the communities where they have lived or worked? No, like I said, fortunately, it's actually one that is going, it's definitely gonna be eradicated quite soon. Um, but roundworm, hookworm, tapeworm, those are all wash-related diseases as well. So let's take a minute and let's think a little bit. We've mentioned some of the diseases that you've seen. So let's actually brainstorm some of the other ones. What are some other wash-related diseases that you know of? I'm gonna grab my marker. Things you've seen in communities where you're working. Skin rashes or bone sores. Yeah. What else? Malnutrition. Malnutrition. Talk to me. Uh, talk to me more about that. Yeah. Malnut. Sorry. Malnutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Cholera. Yeah. So, arsenic, I well, and sort of yeah. other chemical. I guess those might be in different categories. Yeah. Lead, heavy metals. So there are a couple things going on here. So we've talked a little bit about the pathogen side of things. So those are the microorganisms and the microbiological contamination that can make us sick. Um, animal, human feces, and other ways that these pathogens are connected to wash. Those are really important. They they are the largest burden of disease in terms of impact 
on people, adults, children, the most vulnerable. Um, that's what especially children under the age of five are quite vulnerable to WASH-related diseases, where you'll see the largest impact of death um, or other vulnerable populations like people living with HIV AIDS or even in some cases pregnant women, um, where say for example hepatitis E can have a huge impact on, um, on the death rate of a pregnant woman. So that's one side of things, that's the microbiological. That's, that's a priority for us in WASH. But we do have chemical contaminants that are also related to WASH and also quite important. So something like arsenic, there's naturally occurring arsenic. Um, so that's where it's naturally released into the groundwater from the soil surrounding that source. How many of you, who of you have lived in places or know of places where arsenic contamination has been an issue? Bangladesh has a huge problem with arsenic. Yeah, tremendous. So these are your chemicals that are naturally occurring. What other naturally occurring chemicals have a big Impact, yeah, fluoride would be the other one. So arsenic and fluoride. Fluoride, F, sorry. <laughs> yeah, arsenic and fluoride are the two naturally occurring chemicals that we see have bigger impacts. And so where people are working, where those are locally an issue, then that has to be dealt with. And often, one of the best ways is to search for other sources if possible, because chemicals are much more difficult to treat than, our, than the microorganisms. So this fluoride is, uh, but they just want to base on the same fluoride? Yeah, yep, same thing. So with fluoride, at lower doses, it strengthens our teeth and our bones, and at higher doses, it destroys our teeth and our bones. Yeah, so it starts with something called um, dental fluorosis. So you'll start to see little pitting of the teeth. Um, and in fact, I think I was exposed to high doses. I have a little bit of marking um, with them overdosing from where I lived when I was little. Um, and then it, it progresses to attach to the bone, basically. So the fluoride is, trying, is also trying to work its way through the body. It attaches to the bone and it becomes crippling so that people have trouble walking and can cause form deformations of the, of the legs and the bones. So, so those are also definitely diseases related to WASH would be arsenicosis and fluorosis would be the actual diseases themselves. Well, the clean one, meaning that it has no microorganisms. Yeah, the water, and then they try to dig the wells. Yeah. To get away from the polluted rivers, then they have to deal with the arsenic coming up from the water. Yeah. They've often called it the largest mass poisoning in, in human history. Yeah. Because they really did think, I mean, in, in principle, it's much better to be drinking groundwater than to be drinking surface water. Bangladesh is a very large floodplain, so. Um, yeah, it's a yeah, huge, huge challenge. And arsenicosis causes things like, you'll see, you'll, some people you'll start to see pitting and lesions on the hands and the bottom of the feet, but not everyone shows those symptoms. And then it will cause certain types of cancers and sort of a slow chronic, chronic death. Does, does arsenic poisoning, does that take place over years and years? Yes. Or is that a danger to tourists, for example? Or? No, years and years of exposure. Yeah. It's fairly low level. Yes. It's not like it's, it's it sounds like it just builds up. The body can't. Yeah. Away. Yeah. I mean, our our standard for for arsenic here in the U.S. I believe is 10 parts per billion, and in areas of Bangladesh, you'd be looking at hundreds of parts per billion, 200, 300. Um, yeah, huge range above that. And their standard is actually 50 because they know that they can't reach the 10 at this point in time. 
So what happened, what happened with some of the villagers there is that the villagers are going back into the river waters because of the arsenic. Yeah. And they're going back to the other side. Yeah, and I think when we talk a little bit, the, well, this afternoon we'll talk a little bit about the multi-barrier approach to water treatment, and then tomorrow morning we have a session on household water treatment options. So we can talk a little bit more about what are the options then if you're going back to surface water, how can you treat that to make it safer to drink? Because in, in many cases that is a better, that's a, a better option. You can treat it. So, yeah. Um, lead and heavy metals, so talk to me a little bit more for those of you that mentioned this, how is that related to wash? Yeah. It usually affects the kidneys, and those lead, of course, affects um, neurological mm -hmm. problems. And the other kinds of heavy metals typically affect the kidneys. Yeah. Lead, lead were particularly dangerous to children and pregnant women. Yeah, and so these are likely point sources of contamination, usually from mining or some other type of human activity that's bringing that into a local water source. So again, depending on where you are, those might be issues that you're looking at if you do have industry that is polluting open water sources in other areas. Yeah. In the human body, that's a good question. Maybe more for a doctor than for me. I think blood test. Does anyone know the answer to that? Well, you're saying blood, sometimes under your fingernails. Yeah. Mental retardation in children, it's the soul learning, stuff like that. Yeah. And some of these in pregnant women. But it's just a blood test. Blood test, yeah, okay. I probably, similarly to arsenic and fluoride, yes, I'm sure, and depending on the quanti quantity of what's coming in and how it's being brought into the body. And that's what we saw until Flint, Michigan, oh. where it actually started showing up in mouths. But then it was leaching from the pipes. Mm -hmm. Right. From the ground. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Flint, it showed up in, in mouths because it was lead piping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so certainly those are going to be more localized issues. And when we look at water and sanitation globally, we do focus a lot on the microbiological because of that immediate impact to health and immediate in the sense that small children can die quite quickly and adults as well of things like cholera. Um, with rapid dehydration. So it's, I often talk about it like peeling the layers of an onion. Look at the issues that are local and what's the biggest issue? That's your first layer. You've got to deal with that impact first and then you can start digging down into these deeper layers that are also having impacts. How does a local church do this? Yeah, well what do you think? Because <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm going back to what uh, uh, we discussed this morning. How does a local church now fit in this thing, particularly if uh, even a, f a local village uh, this type of diseases are uh, arising? Mm -hmm. you know, because they might have been some type of an activity mm -hmm. that uh, maybe took place years back. Yeah, I know, I remember there was a part in one of Kenya where there was a company that uh, did a lot of mining and they abandoned the mine. Mm -hmm. And then they abandoned a lot of uh, chemicals there. And when the people started doing well, mm -hmm. they started developing uh, cancer. Cancer became so uh, uh, rapid in that neighborhood. So mm -hmm. I, I, then nobody knew what was going on until the, 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 the government came in. And uh, I think it took a long time. And then they found out that uh, there was uh, this way of uh, contamination. Yeah. Had to abandon the entire region of the water. Yeah. And the water had to be pumped from a, a neighboring uh, county or so. So I'm trying to figure out how does a local charge sit in, um, 
tried vocate and mm -hmm. uh, send out the word and even 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 understand mm -hmm. what it means to use a word. <coughs> yeah. Maybe partnering with the local health department or something. Yeah. Yeah. If I heard something else I would over say here. Like keep records. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when people are sick, uh, what I find that when you're a pastor, people give you the medical history. When, when they're sick or when people die, mm -hmm. that they won't tell other people. Mm -hmm. You keep a record of what's happening, and then you maybe you begin to see a pattern. Mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. What are other people's thoughts about this question of the role of the church and all of, and all of this and understanding and? And also to add on that, there are cases where a local a local um, uh, community might look at it from um, maybe a witchcraft uh -huh. point of view. Yeah. You know. Yep. They don't consider it as a, a disease that is being caused by a certain product yep. or a chemical. And look at it from a witchcraft point of view, depending on the cultural issues. And yeah. Like yeah, that's, I'm going to hold that. That's, a, that's another question off of your, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and this gentleman wanted to respond to your in question the as well. I think we say the role of the church is to be a voice for the poor. And uh, that, that we, we, we need to educate the, the, the community. There are times that, uh, you know, some more wishes will come and uh, drill a bobo and uh, maybe you store a handbag and people start using it frequently without testing the water. Mm -hmm. But you know, we need to you know, talk for the community and let uh, you know, a water analysis be done so that we know whether it's, it's fit for human consumption or not. Mm -hmm. if, if it's not, then we have to abandon it. Yep. But without anyone doing that, the community will just say, thank God somebody has answered our prayer and they start using that water. So we need to, <laughs> we, we need to speak for them so that they can have all their wells tested so that they can allow it to work. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a really important step in terms of ensuring safety first, right? Yes, water is a blessing and it's a resource, but knowing it can still, it can make us sick if we drill something that's not safe. Um, but I... I think too that there are so many different roles that we can play and I don't know if I have the answer to the role of, of your church because I, I think that even just gaining knowledge around the issues and then being able to identify what the highest need is, the church can play that role. Um, the church can play an education role. The church can be that model of showing what does good wash look like. Um, it can bring it into your everyday interactions with the, with the community and, um, and with the members of the church so that they're also well informed. But we also know that information and education, while powerful, is sometimes not enough. And it might not overcome those cultural challenges or the, the local beliefs um, that might prevent someone from me believing that, yep, absolutely. I. I'll give you an example. I was working in, in northern Ghana while guinea worm was still very active and present. And in one village where we were, the, the household, the, the son was sick with guinea worm. He had the worm coming out of his ankle. And, and she would say, the mother would say, yes, nope, he drank the contaminated water. Yes, now he has guinea worm. Um, but then she would also say that my neighbor has put a curse on my son mm -hmm. and my son now has guinea worm. And so those types of cultural challenges and local beliefs, um, we have to know them um, and we have to find ways to work with them and perhaps over time. Um, so when tomorrow afternoon, the last session, so 3.15, we'll do a session on behavior change in WASH, and we'll talk about some of these issues exactly around the cultural challenges that we face and that, what do we, how do we address them? Because we have to. Because um, sometimes knowledge alone, it really, it isn't enough. All right. So, Is there anything else you'd like to add to this list?
So let's talk a little bit about transmission routes. So based on what you've heard and what you know, um, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and talk a little bit about the different ways you think these diseases are transmitted. So how are they passed? Um, so I'm gonna, I'll pair you guys up. So let's do, or are you joining? No. No, okay, you two, two, you two, two, <laughs> you two. You two, two, you two, and you three. So talk about that with one another for three minutes. All right, come on back to the large group. And I want to hear a little bit about your conversations in your groups. Um, what about? All right, we're going to start with your group. What was one way that you guys discussed? <laughs> safety in numbers, safety in numbers. Um, well, we, we, we kind of got sidetracked a little bit. I yeah. Guess, because uh, I was thinking in mainly the, uh, the smaller bug things in the water, and kind of got me a little uh, terrified. terrified here talking about all these <laughs> heavy metals and lead. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have that problem, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So. And where is this? Uh, Ecuador. Okay. Yeah. And especially, and I guess my interest has mainly been since our earthquake in April when a couple of our cities were destroyed, and that was a big issue was water. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that was simply access, right? Yeah. Access and safety of that water. And so well, we didn't get to whatever your question was because we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when you do think about that, if there were some of these chemicals in the water, how would it be transmitted? How would I get sick from it? That's not for you. Anyone can answer that. Yeah. This just came up in the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado, <coughs> the legislator, just passed a bill that allows citizens Right. Snow melt framework. Well, reading through that article, they started addressing, okay, if you get the water off the roof, you gotta be aware of that the shingles can have metals, heavy metals. And I had, I never thought about that, you know. I it's you only think so much of the Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it got me thinking, uh, when you gave us the uh, question. That's just one of the sources oh, yeah. now that we have to address in Colorado. Yeah. Is, is we're collecting the water off the roof, and the sh if there's shingles up there, if we use that water in our like vegetable boxes, the vegetables are gone, does that actually get transmitted into the tissue of the flesh, the tissue of the plant that we're going to eat? Right. So that's just an example of what we're confronting. Yep, yeah, thanks. What was another, what did you guys talk about? What was one way that you thought? Like washing their fruits. Like yeah. So that would almost be, that's not necessary. So it's just simply. So contaminated food, great. What was one other way that you guys uh, talked about? This is uh, lack of uh, toilets and uh, uh, lack of uh, sanitized uh, equipment yep. to store the water. Yep, and so when you have all those feces in the environment, mm -hmm. what's one way that I can get <laughs> sick from those feces? Well, when it rains, the feces are are washed into the rivers, and yep. the rivers are used to, to collect water. Yep. And then the water is uh, uh, washed into the water supplies. Mm -hmm. So it would be you drink the water, right? Apply, because it depends on the feces, and then it goes and visits your food source. Yeah.
Yep, flies. What else? I'm shaking. Okay. Yep. So, and then hand shaking, and then I ingest also, right? So it's sort of drinking or ingesting. <coughs> Yeah, talk to me more about that. You're just swapping blood with the last one. The last thing the mosquito put it bit. It's like a, bit, a needle stick in a hospital. Yep. And so Zach had said malaria, which I hadn't written down. What else would be transmitted by mosquitoes? West Nile. West Nile. Chikungunya, Zika, dengue. dengue, yeah. And malaria and dengue probably are the two larger impacts in terms of mosquito-borne viruses. Um, dengue more from a, an illness perspective than a death perspective, but certainly malaria from a, a death perspective. So young children, pregnant women, particularly vulnerable. Um, to dying and the impacts of malaria. My daughter's a flight attendant, and she, her company has been very proactive on the Zika virus mm -hmm. of all young ladies of childbearing age. So they've really tried to keep them on the leading edge of educating them on that. Yeah. They've even allowed them, they were trying to get pregnant to opt out of flying to the Caribbean region and various things like that. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's scary from the perspective of we didn't know until there was an outbreak that there was this impact on pregnant women and feti fetuses and the babies that are born. Um, so really without so many people being infected, we, we never would have been able to know that this was actually a real impact. I know they're working hard on things like vaccines. Um, as well for malaria. I actually think they're getting ready to launch uh, a pretty decent vaccine. And before I jump to you, one question. How, of course, are mosquitoes wash related? Why do we talk about these as wash related? Yeah, they're breeding in stagnant water. So we've got pooled water. Um, and mosquitoes are really just an example, just like flies of insect. We'd say insect vectors. Yeah, you were gonna say something? Yeah, you just made that point. Oh. When you're saying transmission routes, I was thinking of the women and girls, the women and children that carry containers. Most of those containers are probably not sanitized. Yep. Mm -hmm. And mosquitoes is the vector for that thing. Yep. Yeah, what other ways did you talk about in your groups? There are things that were. There are common toilets. Uh, Biosystem is in one toilet. Mm -hmm. so some people they go into their food, mm -hmm. then they get diseases like this. So public toilets. So, yep. Yeah, so those are typically, so we've got. So that's simply coming into contact with feces, just with your skin. Um, so something like hookworm is a really good example of that. That's one that lives in the environment for years and simply in soil as well, or if in a public bathroom, if you're going in barefoot and it's not clean, you're stepping in feces. Um, Hookworm is a pretty nasty parasite that can impact your stomach, your ability to absorb nutrients. Um, we mentioned malnutrition and that impact. When we, when we talk about wash-related diseases, you know, even a child under the age of a year or two years, if they get a particular wash parasite, it can actually scar the lining of your intestines which means that then their intestines 
are never able to fully absorb nutrients going forward because they have had that impact from when they were a very, very small child. That is a huge cause as well of malnutrition. They simply can't absorb the nutrients to be able to, to get what they need to thrive. Yeah. I think uh, also poor hygiene practices. Poor hygiene practices. Right. So everyone goes in there and washes his hands and you come and you wash to the point that, you know, so I think those are, there are many others with, who share water and stuff, so. Yeah. But some are traditional. Yeah, traditional practices that can, yeah. and sometimes those are the hardest, yeah, they're the hardest to help change. Mm -hmm. No, certainly. Any other roots that you that you discussed that we haven't put up here? So I'm going to pop up a few different categories that. So basically, seven different categories that we would put together in terms of transmission of wash-related diseases. Oh, there it goes. So we talked a little bit about drinking water. So in terms of feces, these are usually what we call waterborne diseases. So things like general diarrhea is often some type of bacteria, not always. Diarrhea can also be a symptom of other diseases like malaria. Um, but cholera um, is another, is a bacteria and it would be something that we would get from drinking contaminated water. Typhoid is another one, shigellosis, hepatitis A and E. Hepatitis E is a bit of an emerging virus. Some people aren't aware of that one, but it is, it is waterborne. And as I said before, particularly dangerous for pregnant women. Um, and where, we've, where you've seen more outbreaks tend to be in camp settings, either refugee or internally displaced person camps. Um, but there's actually quite a bit of natural endemic hepatitis E in Nepal and India as well. So there's also washing in water contaminated with excreta. And I haven't defined, excreta is urine and feces. So urine and feces not mixed with anything else, basically. That's how we define excreta. So in terms of washing with contaminated water, are there any that you know of that we would get from washing with contaminated water? Any of the diseases we've mentioned so far? Yeah, skin infections. The other really big one is schistosomiasis. Um, so where you're, these are water-based. So schistosomiasis is one where there's a host organism and it's a snail. So it's endemic off in parts of Southern Africa in particular, Lake Malawi is quite notorious for schistosomiasis. So the feces go into the water, the snails absorb the pathogen, the snail, lets the pathogen out and then it just has to touch your skin and you yeah, become you, sick. You mentioned Lake Malawi. Yeah. I'm from Malawi. You are. Uh, one of the problems I think that we had is that um, actually the government right now has uh, introduced a way of helping people not to uh, help themselves in the water. Yeah, tell us more about so this. Sometimes people, those that live close to the lake, uh -huh. do not build toilets. Yeah. Do not dig toilets. 
whenever they feel like they want to help themselves, they just go to their waters if they want to take a shower. Yeah. And then do that, they will, uh, they will do that. But the government um, is trying to teach people the right. importance of having toilets because uh, uh, that will help themselves but also help the, help the, the nation. Yeah. That's, uh, so in the morning when we were discussing, I wanted to comment, but then I think time was over, that uh, as a church, we can work with the government because these people are members in our churches. Mm -hmm. So as a church, we can work with the government in order to encourage people the importance of, uh, uh, of using toilets and also uh, following right methods of uh, hygiene. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like the government is being very proactive to take that first step, right? No feces in the water, then you stop the transmission. Yeah, thank you. So lack of water for basic hygiene, those are ones that we would call water washed. So trachoma is one that's caused by a bacteria. Is anyone here familiar with trachoma? A little bit, a little bit, you probably are. Yeah, that one is a fly that the lands usually on the face and near the eye, and then the bacteria um, infects the body and the eyes, and eventually, if it's not treated, it's actually quite easy to treat with antibiotics, but if it's not treated, it can cause blindness. Yeah. I just say permanent. Yep, permanent blindness. Scabies would be another one that would be water washed. So contact with soil, contaminated with excreta. We talked a little bit about that in terms of being barefoot. Um, hookworm being a good example of that. So insects that breed or live in standing water. We talked about malaria and dengue and some of these other West Nile virus, Zika. You'd also have things like yellow fever, which is a virus, also transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, river blindness, which is a helminth, and it's transmitted by the black fly, is the vector. And then sleeping sickness, which is a protozoa, and that comes from the tsetse fly, is the vector. So there are also insects that breed or live in animal excreta. And so those are um, things like leishmaniasis, which is a protozoa and gets passed by sand flies. And then finally, rodents that breed or live in unsanitary conditions. Um, so rats, mice, um, things like hantavirus, typhus, which is a bacteria, um, Leptospirosis, which is also a bacteria, bubonic plague, which is more famous for being transmitted by rats. So those are all kind of broadly under wash potential diseases that we can impact, we can, that ha can have an impact on us. So what I'd like us to do is to talk a little bit about prevention and to use some tools that um, can be used to talk about transmission and prevention of these different diseases. So I have a few different activities and I'm going to divide you up into groups, but before I do, I'll explain the tools. Um, so both of these are activities that we've adapted. They're fairly well-known participatory learning tools that help to generate discussion and conversation around disease transmission and WASH practices. Um, so one is called the Transmission Roots Activity and focuses on, on having people discuss how do we get sick. It can help us to evaluate, well, what are the local beliefs about how we get sick? Um, what's their knowledge to date? And it provides us as facilitators with an opportunity to understand what those beliefs are and to help educate around them. So the transmission roots activity is one. The second activity is something that we call three pile sorting, uh, which helps you to look at practices and again identify which ones might be good practices, which ones are okay, 
and these we would call bad practices in terms of it's gonna, that particular practice is probably gonna make us sick if we do that. So for the transmission routes activity, I'll basically give you a starting point of a person and an end point, and then you as a group need to decide how does this individual get sick? And then you need to decide how can you prevent that transmission? What will you do? So you'll do that mapping. Um, then the other group will simply look at and design, okay, we're gonna look at our evaluation of good, okay, bad, and we're gonna categorize those. So discuss them as a group and decide this is a good practice, this is an okay practice, this is a bad practice. How many of you have ever used these tools before? Yeah, a little bit. How many of you know about similar tools? Okay, so for most it's new, which is great. You're gonna have a chance to do both activities so you can get a feel for it, and then we'll debrief as a large group. So I'm just gonna count two, four, six, eight, 14, 15, 18, 20, 21. So I'm gonna do, let's do four groups. Um, so I'll have you number off um, from one to four, and I'll start one. Great. So I'm going to have ones kind of over here, twos over here, threes over here, and fours back here. And I will come find you. Thanks. So let's do a, a really quick debrief. Um, I'm curious, the transmission routes activity, what were some of your impressions or thoughts about that activity? What did you feel worked well? Was there something confusing about it? What kind of discussions did you guys have? In our group, we noticed that some things were hard to judge because you don't know how they're gonna use the water afterwards. Yep, so thinking more with the three piles or sorting. Yep, okay, let's take that one first then. Um, three piles, so hard to judge because you're not sure what happens, what happened before, what happened after. Sure, what else? What else was a challenge with with three pile sorting. Well, there's like different schools of thought on the hand washing piece with the towel or without the towel. Do you mm -hmm. use a towel that's been there and everybody's you know using or just air dry or stuff like that? It's subjective. Yeah. And, and were you able to come to a conclusion or any resolutions around yeah, that? Agreed to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes that might be the case. I think one of the things I love about the activity is seeing people have some really heated discussions sometimes about how they interpret a picture. And that, it really is just a valuable discussion. It can help you understand what, what the impression is. How are they reading that? Um, and yeah, what, at the end of the day, it's about is this practice going to impact my health? And that discussion can be very valuable to assess yeah, okay, that's something that could be, could be potentially harmful or could make me sick. Um, if I've got a dirty towel that I'm passing around after hand washing, UNICEF has moved to the air dry because they know that that towel is often not clean. So it's just passing bacteria back and forth between people. Yeah, other thoughts about three pile sorting? Okay, what about the transmission routes activity? So, where you were trying to prevent the little boy or the little girl from getting sick from feces. One of our, one of our groups um, was pointing out that the type of toilet that was being presented uh, wouldn't be able to trap flies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it might not be a perfect solution, right? Yeah. Good point. What other discussions did you have?
pretty simple, fun activities to get people talking. And what we find is certainly when we're working in community with people, people want to be engaged and they want to be active. And so these are some simple ways to do that. So these activities we have in six regional styles. So we have a Latin America, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, and Caribbean, prim primarily Haiti. Um, so they're all up on our website, uh, which I, I've got up here and I can share with you guys, free to download and use. We also have lesson plans that you can use and adapt to be able to work with different types of groups. Um, so that was one tool. Um, I'd like to, if you'd like to stay for five more minutes, I'd like to show you one other tool that I think is really neat. We won't have time to debrief it, but it's a really short video um, called The Story of Cholera. And while it talks a little bit about cholera, it's really true for any of these waterborne diseases where we're drinking um, contaminated water. And I quite like it. It's been translated into a number of different languages as well. So I would say just think a little bit about how you might use this to educate around wash and disease transmission. And so that can kind of be your takeaway to share with someone as you walk out. How would you use this video? This is the story of how cholera changed my village. Tiny germs of cholera, too small to see spread through the river. So small, yet so dangerous. Without realizing, women carried cholera home in the water. Flies carried cholera on their feet. Unwashed hands spread it too. We swallowed cholera germs in our water on our food and on our fingers. It happened so fast. By morning, my father was very sick. He had diarrhea that looked like gray water and poured out of him. I was so scared. I went for help. I never rode so fast. One look at my father and the nurse knew it was cholera. We had to work fast to save him. We made a special drink to help him. First, we made the water safe. We filtered it through cloth and boiled it for one minute. Then we mixed half a teaspoon of salt and six teaspoons of sugar in one liter of this safe water. It tasted like tears, not too salty. I worried my father would die before my eyes, but he soon felt a little stronger. The nurse explained to me that not everyone who swallows cholera germs gets sick like my father, but they can still spread the disease. Now I needed to take safe water to my village and teach them how to protect themselves from cholera. I saw a girl carrying water. I told her she could make the water safe by adding chlorine drops and waiting half an hour. There was a man about to eat with unclean hands. I told him to always wash his hands with soap and safe water after going to the toilet. Only with clean hands could he eat safely. I saw villagers spreading cholera into our river. I told them we needed to dig latrines far from the river, at least 30 meters away. This was important to keep our village clean. I found a mother preparing unsafe food. I told her, first, we must wash our hands with safe water. Then, we had to wash and peel the food, cook it and always eat it hot. 
and protect it from flies. I spread the word throughout my village and ran to find my father. I was so happy to see he was better. Our village became healthy. Now we filter and boil our water to make sure it is safe. We always use latrines and always wash our hands after. Food is safe from flies, washed and peeled and cooked. And we always wash our hands before cooking and eating. We made our village safe from cholera. Spread the word. Your village can be safe too.